Thank you very much, Dean Filizola. It's a great pleasure to welcome our graduate students and their families. As Dennis said, this is our inaugural white coat ceremony. We're the only school in New York that offers this, one of the few in the country. Yet we believe that this is a very important milestone because of the increasing scrutiny placed on the nation's biomedical research enterprise and the unique responsibility that each of you will take once you complete your training. First, why a lab coat? Those of you who know me, never this is the first time you've ever seen me in a lab coat. The only time I put on a lab coat is when the Mount Sinai press office wants to take a picture of me. Uh, we chose the lab coat as a universal symbol of biomedical research, regardless of one's discipline or experimental approaches. Not everyone uses a pipette, a microscope, a flow cytometer, a cryostat, plus handing out cryostats might be challenging. <laughs> the lab coat for scientists likely evolved from aprons, smocks, and related protective garments worn in the Middle Ages by blacksmiths and other craftsmen to protect the individuals from spills and contamination. By the mid-1800s, beige and then white was selected as the uniform for scientists, and some scholars speculate that white was selected because it was the least expensive fabric. But white quickly became to signify also cleanliness and respect. And in fact, by 1900, the white lab coat represented the professionalism of science that was so highly respected in our society that physicians actually adopted the white lab coat uh, from scientists. Doctors' coats at the turn of the last century were black to reflect the somberness of their profession. And they adopted the white lab coat to uh, gain respect from the glow of science. And it's funny, today the white lab coat makes a scientist or doctor official. I went online looking to purchase a lab coat, for example, and there are, lab, there are uh, uh, websites that sell lab coats for parties at home. And there is one online site that said, lab coats will make children and adults, and I quote, feel like they're officially putting on their thinking caps, and it's time to innovate. And I gather that even Dr. Bunsen Honeydew, the resident scientist on The Muppet Show, wears a, light, wears a white lab coat. So although science today is under attack from extremists of many political stripes, and I want to emphasize that it's not just one side, Science is attacked from all directions. Science still represents the promise for the future, economic advancement, improved health, and better lives. And that's the main reason why there remains today a bipartisan consensus in Congress, which has overseen a 22% increase in the NIH budget over the past three years. Both houses of Congress just passed an additional $2 billion increase in the NIH budget, now awaiting the president's signature. That's a phenomenal demonstration of faith uh, in our uh, profession. So when we put on this lab coat, figuratively or literally, we accept several obligations from a society that values and respects us considerably, but also expects a great deal in return. And I refer to these obligations, and Dennis alluded to some of them already, as the four R's. Rigor, reproducibility, robustness, and responsibility. Rigor signifies exactness, carrying out our research with precision and accuracy, with sound experimental design and definitive replication. Reproducibility means that the results that we report to the public can be trusted, that others will be able to repeat them. There's been a lot of discussion over the past decade about our failure for rigor and reproducibility. One important salvo was a paper published by Amgen scientists, for example, in 2012 in the journal Nature, in which the authors found that only 11% of preclinical cancer studies could be replicated. There are many root causes of the replication crisis. In fact, Wikipedia even has a page called Replication Crisis. But I think one that's not adequately recognized our scientific journals. Our so-called best journals have devolved into Time Magazine equivalents of science. 
where only brief, simple, linear, and uncomplicated stories can be published, and from which any complicating data are removed, often at the request of the editors. Placing methods and many uh, uh, figures and data in supplemental material makes the situation far worse. Correcting this distortion created by our top journals has to be a high priority for all of us. NIH's response is overly bureaucratic, such as inclusion of an authentication of reagent section in all grants, which will not fix the problem. Ultimately, the lack of good rigor and reproducibility is our responsibility. It represents, in my view, scientific malpractice by too many of us, and is something that all of us have to address. Now, being rigorous and reproducible is not enough. Our experimental findings must also matter. They must be biologically important with meaningful ramifications. I refer to this as robustness or relevance. Many statistically significant findings are too small in magnitude to have any practical significance. Also, just walk the floor of any national meeting. Thousands of abstracts on the floor, far too many of them using outdated old methods and uh, lack innovation. The work is stale. And this is true not only for basic research, but for clinical research as well. John Ioannidis at Stanford University has written extensively on this subject. According to him, many, perhaps even most, clinical studies are not useful because they are performed for too short a period of time, examine too small a group of patients, and fail to address medically important questions. And many findings are too highly variable in the population to be of diagnostic or prognostic significance for any given individual. Ioannidis suggests improved transparency of studies, cross-checking findings across collaborating laboratories, studies of sufficient duration and sample size to make the patient-centered research that we do more impactful. And here's a warning. The more extravagant the claims of a study, and this is true for basic science and clinical science, the less likely it will be replicated. Because biological sciences simply doesn't have that many eureka moments. Yet extravagant claims are needed for publishing in a top journal that is more interested in its impact factor than the truth. That brings us to the fourth R, responsibility. Those of us in academia have the awesome privilege to spend taxpayers' hard-earned income on scientific research that for most of us is more than a job, it's our hobby. The median annual income of an American working full-time in 2017 was just under $40,000. Your PhD stipends are already almost that high and our postdoctoral fellows make considerably more. That means that people who make much less money than we do are giving us, through their taxes, funding for our research. And we owe our fellow citizens meaningful research that we can trust and that will matter. That means research that will contribute to fundamental advances in science and medicine. As you all embark, on your graduate student careers, please keep all of this in mind. Work hard, do what's important, make a difference, and of course, enjoy what you do. I consider myself one of the luckiest guys alive because I go to work every day and have had the privilege to run a lab and work with young people like yourselves. I, I, I love doing it. It's my passion. And I hope that each and every one of you will find something to do with your PhDs that will be just as rewarding. Thank you.